Amen. David, can you hear me good back there? All right. So I always got to do a little sound check, make sure you can hear me, because it sounds weird from my end. But church, have you ever really stopped and thought about it? Of course we would say no, we wouldn't be the one that would hold the hammer in our hand if we were back then, would we? Would we, we be the one to nail Jesus to the cross? We'd say no. But we don't really know, do we? Our lives before we were saved are evident that, yes, we probably would have been that man. Right? But the truth is, we've all been forgiven, haven't we? Remember that. You know, we're 42 weeks into the life of Christ. If, if you're listening online and you haven't been following, here at Midweek Connections, we've been exploring the life of Christ in a chronological order. And we're 42 weeks in. We're actually closing in on his crucifixion. We're not in, in the life of Jesus, we're not too far away from his crucifixion. For us, we're a little bit further away because there's still a lot of testimonies we're going to examine before we get there. But last week, last week we left off seeing the disciples arguing amongst themselves who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We then heard Jesus warn them not to cause others to stumble, and he taught us the parable of the wandering sheep. Now, for us, it's been now five weeks since we saw Jesus and the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. But remember, for Jesus and his disciples, that was just eight days ago. Just eight days ago, Peter and the other disciples were with Jesus when Jesus took them to what the world calls the gates of hell. And he made this claim, on this rock I'll build my church. Remember, that's where we heard Peter, the Petros, not the Petra, proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. After this, immediately, immediately after that, Jesus told them about his crucifixion that's upcoming. And we found Jesus saying to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you're a stumbling block to me. You don't have the concerns of God in mind, just mere human concerns. That all happened in one day. The Bible then tells us six days later the transfiguration happened. Then on the next day, day eight, the disciples wound up not being able to cast out a demon because, as Jesus said, they had such little faith. So what did the disciples decide to do? They decided that it would be best for them just to sit around and argue about which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now for us last week, like I said, we ended with the parable of the wandering sheep. But Jesus didn't stop his teachings with his disciples there. And so you know today for us, we are still on that day eight here today. This is the same day that the argument started amongst the disciples of who would be the greatest. Now, Todd, as a slide for us, as you could see, today we're going to be looking at how to deal with sin in the church and the parable of the unmerciful servant, which, in case you didn't realize, go hand in hand. See, dealing with sin in the church is a problem, is it not? That's why the parable of the unmerciful servant comes in to follow. It'll, it'll make sense in a minute. And as we hear this testimony today, just keep in mind that nothing has changed since last week when we were here. Truthfully, nothing has changed at all in the last eight days of these disciples' lives. And in verses, uh, verses 15 to 35 of Matthew 18, we find Jesus saying to them, If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens, and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back so that everything you say may be confronted by two or three witnesses. Then if that person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. 
And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this. If two or three, if two of you agree here on, any, on earth concerning anything you ask for, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often shall I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied. Seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process... One of his debtors, who was brought in, owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned, to pay his debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I'll pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him. And he re released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant? just as I had mercy on you. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers or sisters from your heart. Now to fully understand what Jesus is saying and what's taking place First off, in our hearts, we need to know that everything is contingent on what God has to say and not what mankind, law, rules, government, or anyone else has to say. And last week, for us, and just a few minutes ago for the disciples, we heard Jesus clearly saying to his disciples and to us, Right, Todd? Truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And here for us today, we find Jesus starting off telling us how to address the issue of another believer sinning against you. Jesus says what? Point out the offense to them. And if the other person listens and confesses, you've won them back. So let's stop for a moment, because for most Christians, this is where we begin to join in the sin with the one who sinned against us. Jesus says to point out the offense to them, not to Pat, not to Bob, not to Rick, not to Marsha, not, not to Louisa, Dave, or anyone else, right? Point out the offense to them. But just like senseless children do, when someone does wrong, the first thing mankind likes to do is go point out their offense to everyone else but the offender. I mean, soberly ask yourself, how many times have I spoken out about, how many times have I spoken out to someone else about someone else's sin that they have committed instead of confronting the person themselves? instead of doing what Jesus says we have to do and point out the offense to them. I mean, if we did, just perhaps, 
Perhaps, as Jesus says, if we go and point out the offense to them, they might just listen, and they might just confess their sins. And if they do, Jesus said we've won them back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, then take your case to the church. If he or she won't accept the church's decision, then you treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. And unfortunately, listen, unfortunately, this too is where Christians do not understand, Christians that do not understand what God is saying, often to fall into sin again. And why? Because truthfully, as God says, my people, and this is true, this is what God says, he says, my people are fools because they don't know me. They're senseless children that have no understanding. They're skilled in doing evil and they don't know how to good. Church, let me ask you, how would you treat a pagan or a corrupt tax collector? Seriously, church, stop and think about that. How would you treat a pagan or a corrupt tax collector? Put in any other sinful people in there. You don't have to be a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. But how would you treat them? Now remember, in the life of Christ, just a few minutes ago, just a few minutes ago, Jesus was telling the disciples, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, Jesus says, he is happier about that one sheep than the ninety-nine that did not wander off. Jesus says, in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any one of these little ones perish. So church, how would you treat a pagan or a corrupt tax collector, a sinner? Perhaps to correctly answer that question, we need to go back, right? This is something we don't often do, but as Christians, we should. We should always be going back to the foundational building blocks. We need to go back to Luke chapter 6 and see what Jesus has to say. Jesus says, but to you who are listening, right? Not you who are hearing, because you who hear don't do nothing. It ain't no good anyways. But to you who are listening, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do only good, to those who do good for you. Why should you get credit? Even sinners do that. And if you lend money to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be great, and you will be truly acting as children of the Most High. For He, He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. So you, you must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. So church, how would you treat a sinner, a, ta a tax collector, a pagan? Would you love them? Would you bless them? Would you pray for them? Would you turn the other cheek and let them sin against you again? Would you give to them? Would you do good for them? Would you love a pagan or a corrupt tax collector? Would you love your enemy? 
Listen, I know we all fail miserably here at this point, right? And I know this is a hard teaching. I mean, at times, we feel like Peter, right? We feel like Peter, who in verse 21, came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus replied, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And don't even try to figure out the mathematical equation on that one. Jesus didn't mean on the 491st time we can beat them for sinning against us. And that is why Jesus used this extremely graphic parable of the unmerciful servant for us to better understand. Because we just don't get it. We just don't get it. Let's look at this parable one more time with a little bit better of a freshly godly perspective on how we should treat a pagan or corrupt tax collector, how we should treat our enemy or our brother or sister in Christ, our fellow mankind. In verse 23 and following, Jesus says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. I'm going to stop here for a second, because in case you didn't realize, that's who we were. We're this guy. We're the man that fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And the master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and he had the man put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man who, had forget, who, had, who he had forgiven and he said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants? Just, I have had mercy on you? And the angry king sent the man to, be prison, to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then Jesus says this, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now let's stop for a moment and really think about what God tells us about who we are through his word. And if you've been following the life of Christ with us since the beginning, then you know that we have heard that when God saves us, that God adopts us into sonship, that we are brothers and sisters of Christ. And more so, Romans 8.17 tells us, and since we are God's children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Listen, because God so loved us, right? Because he so loved us, and because Jesus willingly gave up his life for us, we get to share in the inheritance of Jesus and the benefits of his kingdom. By God's grace, through faith, because of God's love and mercy, and because of Jesus, we have been made like the king 
who decided to bring his accounts up to date. Now, don't get me wrong. We are not the king, but we are co-heirs with the kingdom. And therefore, we've been made like the king. That means we share Jesus' inheritance along with all his other brothers and sisters, even those who sin against you. I mean, isn't that exactly who we are? If we truly are saved, if we truly are children of God, that means at one point in your life, you came to the king and you fell down before him and you pleaded with God to forgive you of the sin that you committed against him. And you ask God to fill this void that you created yourself that you could never repair. A wage of sin that you could never repay. You pleaded with God to be patient with you. Asking God to help you learn how to grow in him. And to become more like him. Asking God to have patience with you. When you sin against him. After all, church, is this not what you did when you came to God and asked him to forgive you of your sins? And did not God, the master, the king, release us from the sin that so easily entangled us? And did not God, the king, forgive us of our debt? Then why? Why do we choose to be the unmerciful servant? Why, after God, the king, forgave us of our debt, do we want to grab our brothers and sisters by the throat and demand instant payment for the sins they committed? Why, church, do we want the one who offended to us to be arrested and put in prison, in the prison of shame, and stand guilty before all others? Why and how can anyone who is saved be so cruel and so mean to their own brothers and sisters? The answer always goes back to what God has said in Jeremiah 4.22. It's because his people are fools. They don't know him. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They're skilled in evil, and they don't know how to do good. Listen, I know personally in my younger years with Christ, if I would have focused more on my relationship and obedience to Christ than focusing on other people's sins, I wouldn't have hurt so many people along the way. The truth is, when God first saved me, I knew nothing about him. Outside that his son was Jesus and there was a man named Noah who built a boat. That's about it. So, of course, of course, I was a senseless child that had no understanding. I knew nothing about him. I came from a life that was skilled at doing evil, and I knew yet not how to do anything good. I had to learn through God's word what God's good and perfect and pleasing will is. I had to give my body, including my mind, right? Often we hear give our body, we think about servitude. No, we had to give my mind also as a living sacrifice to God because of all that he's done for me. I had to let my body and mind be that living sacrifice, the kind that God will find acceptable. After all, this is truly the way to worship him, right? That's what the scriptures say. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by, creating the way, by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Listen, the Bible tells us, because of the privilege and authority that God has given us, he also gives us this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given you. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part is a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we belong to each other. So church, how would you treat 
a pagan, a tax collector, or your brother or sister who sins against you, would you treat them with love and kindness? Would you pray for them in a manner, in a way that Jesus would pray for them? Would you perhaps say to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing? Or would you be like the man who left the king and went to a fellow servant and grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment? Listen, I don't know about you guys. I know my dad knows this. There's only one reason you grab somebody by the throat, right? That's to choke the life out of them. It's the only reason you touch anybody on their throat. Do you realize when we're not kind and compassionate, forgiving others just as freely as God has forgiven us, spiritually speaking, we are grabbing our brothers and sisters by the throat and choking the spiritual life out of them. Let me tell you, this is a dangerous place to find ourselves. I mean, just look at, once again, what the king has to say on the matter. In verse 32, we find the king called in the man that he had forgiven. And he said to the man, You evil servant, I forgave you of that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And Jesus says, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Listen, church, Jesus started this day off. He started this day off telling his disciples who had been arguing with each other, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And now, Jesus is ending the day, ending this teaching by telling them that the angry king will send that person to prison to be tortured until his debt is paid. And Jesus says, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Listen, church, I don't even want to begin to get into what that means. But just stop and ask yourself, do you really want to mess around and find out? Do you really want to be disobedient to what God's telling us and find out what he means by that? Has Jesus already told us, if our hand causes us to sin, cut it off. If our foot causes us to sin, cut it off. If our eyes cause us to sin, gouge them out. And we already looked at what Jesus meant when he told us that the first time. But for those of you who weren't here, let me just tell you what Jesus meant, what Jesus was saying through a little story about our old friend Agnes Scrooge. Remember her? She's not a real person. Don't worry. I know, you're running through the databank. I don't remember her. No, it's from a story that you've all probably heard before, but it, it really paints a good picture. Agnes Scrooge was at church one day, and she went to the pastor and said, I won't be coming to this church anymore. I see people on their cell phones during service. Some are gossiping. Other people aren't living right. And everyone here is just a bunch of hypocrites. So the pastor got silent and said, okay. But before you go, can I ask you to do something? And she said, what? He said, take this glass of water. Walk around the church a couple times. And don't let any of the water fall out. She said, of course I could do that. So she did. And when she was done, she came back. And she said, see, no problem at all. That was too easy, Pastor. He then asked her three questions. Did you see anybody on your phone? Did you see anybody gossiping? Was anybody doing anything wrong? And she replied, I didn't see anything. I was too focused on the water. So he told her, now focus that same way with your walk with the Lord. Right? Church, as we close... We really got to stop focusing everyone else's speck in their eye. 
We need to work on the plank that's in our own mind. Because the absolute truth is God has forgiven the debt that we ourselves couldn't pay. And he did so while we were still sinners, right? Because after all, after all, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only for those who do good for you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money to only those who can pay you, why are you going to get any credit? Love your enemies. Do good to them. Bless them. Pray for them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Just as God has done for you. You know that? God's done the same thing for us. He saved some of us that he knew he was not going to get any return out of. Right? There's many people who have accepted the salvation of Christ and have done nothing for him at all. And thank God that salvation is not dependent on works. Is it? No, it's not. But God does expect a return in his investment. And even though he knew some of us weren't even going to give him an ounce of return, and he knew we were nothing but filthy sinners, he still chose to forgive us. And then we want to walk out of his kingdom, a free man, and look at our brothers and sisters and choke the life out of them because they sinned against us? Jesus said, Our Father will treat us the same way we treat them, right? What God wants us to do is do exactly what he did for us and freely share that same grace, love, and mercy with even our enemies who sin against us. And Jesus says, then, if we do that, we will be truly acting as children of the Most High. Because remember, church, for God himself is kind to those who are unthankful and even the wicked. And because Christ has saved us, we must also be compassionate, just as our Father is compassionate. Amen? Church, this is a hard teaching. I know that one, right? Honestly, I want you guys to go home. If you truly care about your walk with Christ, if you truly care about being part of Midweek Connections, go home. Look at this parable, the unmerciful servant again. Ask God, where do you fit in? Where do you fit in? Are you truly being the king that, that just forgives the debt? Are you being him? Are you still the one that needs to be forgiven of your debt? Or are you being the unmerciful servant? Because you only want to be the first one. You definitely don't want to be the second one. Or the third one. We want to be the king. We want to act like the king. We want to be the men and women Jesus called us to be. And the only way that is possible is if we stop acting like senseless children and we replace our stinking thinking with, with the truth of God, with the way he tells us to act. Because if we just keep acting like, like we were taught and we were raised and we know how, this world's never going to see Christ in us. It's our job. It's our job to give God back a little return on the investment he made in us. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, that as we continue on just, just examining the life of your son, that as hard as these teachings seem, it's just the next step in the road that you have for us, Father. Any man or woman that's been to basic training, they understand day one, day two is kind of easy, but as weeks go on, it gets harder and harder and harder. But eventually you graduate and you become the person you're supposed to be. So Lord, I thank you for the, even these hard teachings because we truly need them. We don't know any different on our own. We know nothing. We are senseless children without you, Lord. So continue to bless us with your wisdom, with your peace, your patience, and your mercy. And continue to give us the opportunities to be your example here on earth. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask this.
Amen. Amen. Todd, go ahead and play that last song for us.